I'm so excited to have you be a part of the Insert Credit Universe Geo. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm. I thank you for asking me to do it. I'm. What a game to start with. Uh, that's that's lovely. <laughs> I'll have you know that this is a first for our show. We have never taken an episode to review a video game before. Ooh, it's just not what we do. Yeah, yeah. Final Fantasy is just too big of a thing it's sort of like i used yeah. to compare it to uh saturday night live and that it's just eternal it, no matter how good or bad it is it's always around and people have strong opinions on it and want me to die <laughs> 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 Should not be out of doors. We have discussed this. This is episode 295 of Insert Credit. This week, we're breaking our traditional format of selected topics where I try my best to get the panel to talk about old games I don't know about, punctured by a horrible buzzer, for a long-form discussion of a brand new video game you actually may have heard about. This is our final Fantastacular 16. I'm Alex Jaffe, and my first Final Fantasy was Tactics Advance. I'm Gita Jackson, and my first Final Fantasy was Final Fantasy X, watching it over my older brother's shoulder. Oh, uh, similar with me, but for my dorm mate in uh, <laughs> college at the time. Oh, cute, cute. I'm Ash Parrish, and my first Final Fantasy was Final Fantasy VIII that I found on a demo disc for my brother's uh, PlayStation 1. Cool. And uh, hi, I'm Giovanni Colantonio, and my first Final Fantasy was looking at the box art for Final Fantasy Tactics in a BJ's when I was a kid and being like, man, I really want this game. I don't know anything about it, and then not getting it. So I guess it wasn't my <laughs> first, but I did see it. That was the first one I saw and remember. It gave you the bug. Yeah, I was like, ooh, that's a cool name. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Giovanni Colantonio, he's uh, done gaming, uh, reporting for Digital Trends, Inverse, uh, Polygon, a bunch of other places. You've got a podcast yourself, right? Yes, I do a show called Left Trigger, Right Trigger. It's We call it a video game book club, and it's very inaccurate, but it, that's what we call it. <laughs> cool. That's the opposite of our mission statement here, but we're yeah. doing it this week anyway. Perfect. <laughs> The one thing I refuse to ask my uh, panelists usually is, what have you been playing lately? Uh, and everything we do is in opposition to that. But uh, this week, we're actually going to do it. We're actually going to talk about Final Fantasy 16 with a bunch of people who have written extensively about Final Fantasy 16. Here is how this is going to work. First, we're going to talk about Final Fantasy 16 as a game. Uh, we're going to leave story out of it. Let's talk about Final Fantasy. As a Final Fantasy. What does it mean? that I Is this a Final Fantasy game? What is a Final Fantasy game? So I think one of the more difficult things to answer is whether or not this is a Final Fantasy game. Because so many Final Fantasy games have been mechanically wildly different. Mm -hmm. um, and this one also makes a huge leap in a new direction. But I think mechanically, something that makes it feel unlike in a negative way from all the other Final Fantasies, is that it does not do a good job of paying homage to Final Fantasy's roots, the turn-based role-playing game. It, in every respect, is extremely linear and extremely streamlined. I, I remember looking at, uh, I, I really, really, really love the, the fast-paced Devil May Cry style combat in this game. Oh, yeah. I think it's so thrilling. It's so much fun. But I do remember getting ability points and then looking at what I could spend them on and being like, that's it? <laughs> These are my only options? I agree. Yeah, just going to say, um, you know, in terms of is it Final Fantasy, I, I thought about that a lot when, when talking about this. And I think ultimately I was kind of like, I think the only thing that makes a Final Fantasy game at this point in 2023 is the fact that it's different <laughs> than the other <laughs> games. And it's sure different. Um, I remember interviewing the team behind this like a couple months ago and I asked them, to you what's a final fantasy game and they were like oh it has magic and moogles and chocobos and i was like okay i, I guess i guess that's all it means so i i guess so but to me final fantasy at this point is just like a brand name like it yeah. really does just kind of feel like a brand name and i think that's fine but I, I think i wrote this in my review where it was like if this game had just been on a sony state of play revealed with the title like iconic chronicles or iconic legacy right would people react to it 
in the same way that they're reacting to it now. I, I, I don't know. Um, people ask that question all the time with like Pokemon. Like if this wasn't Pokemon, would people like it? And it's like, well, yeah, because the design philosophy is the same. But with this, it's like, I, don't, I genuinely don't know. It, it really is just kind of its own video game. The answer to that question is no, emphatically no. Yeah. Absolutely. Nobody would because <laughs> I, like the rest of you, really enjoyed the game and it's like Devil May Cry vibes, but all the RPG aspects kind of left me feeling cold. And if this game had any other name, we would not be talking about it like this. Forspoken, for instance. Let's, yes. let's, exactly. let's just bring that in here. All right. Start to Forspoken time was very <laughs> short. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to play Forspoken. I have a code square sent me somewhere in my email that I should redeem. Oops. But I remember how resistant people were to a Square Enix game that was high fantasy, that had this fast-paced combat, but wasn't a Final Fantasy game, and how skeptical they were in of all of its imperfections, which it wasn't a perfect game. You know, I wonder if this was, you know, uh, yeah, iconic le legacy, let's say, instead of Final yeah. Fantasy. I do feel like people would be more open to talking about the things they don't like about the game, but I, I feel like... Final Fantasy as a genre, as a as a, an institution, just means so much to people at this point that no one can ever be normal about it ever again. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the anecdote I remember is there was a Sony State of Play, um, I think like a, a year or two ago, I think it was last year, where they started showing this like strategy game. And I was, you know, following the talk about the game on social, like the stream on social when it happened. And immediately people were like, Final Fantasy Tactics, yeah! And people were like going nuts for like two minutes while this trailer played. And then it was like, this game's the Dio Field Chronicles. And everyone was like, oh, we don't yep, care anymore. I knew that's what you're going for. Yeah, yeah and, it's like, <laughs> and it's like, oh, suddenly we don't care. We were all really excited for two minutes about this game until it didn't have the brand name on it. And so, yeah, I, I, I kind of get that vibe with this where like, I wish we could have A-B tested this, you know, in, in a world where they put it out with a different name because... I really think the conversation would be so, so different right now. Yeah. Uh, I hear a lot of comparisons to Devil May Cry in the uh, conversation about this game. But, like, we've talked about it as a Final Fantasy game, but as a Devil May Cry game, does it work? Would people who love Dem Devil May Cry love this? Would people who hate Devil May Cry hate this? What's the difference? I think the people who love Devil May Cry probably won't jive with this because it takes itself way too seriously. Yeah. And I think yeah. one of the selling points of Devil May Cry, in addition to its action, is its kind of irreverence and its like happy-go-lucky funness that this game just does not have. So I don't, I don't think that this will translate well for for Devil May Cry fans who are looking to get into the series, unfortunately. But you know what does? Uh, Stranger of Paradise yeah. <laughs> definitely does not take itself seriously. <laughs> it's not the same kind of, uh, of of action, but it like kind of feels like that. So, Devil May Cry fans, if you want a Final Fantasy game, go over there because they got good shit going on. <laughs> I think there's one area in specific of this game that Devil May Cry fans would like, and it's the hunts. The hunts yes. are the coolest thing yeah. in this game, mechanically, I think. And it's the only one where I feel like the game actually wants me to use my brain. Uh, every other <laughs> mechanic in this game, it is so linear that I don't feel like much thinking is involved for me. But yeah. the hunts, the, eventually you unlock a hunt board and you get, they have posters up on it. And the uh, they have short descriptions and a general location for where that thing will be. But otherwise, it's not marked on a map. You just have to go find it. And when you do, these are just optional boss battles essentially and they are pretty hard and they are very rewarding and it is just about the pure chaos of using all your iconic powers and that's when the game for me is at its most exhilarating that and the the boss fights again once you've gone through all this narrative stuff that we'll talk about later but that just didn't really interest me that much and is extremely self-serious you get to these boss fights and then they are actually just elements of spectacle that yeah. are ridiculous yeah. to behold. Like during the Bahamut bash fight, which I know you and me, Ash, have been tweeting about this back and forth a little Vaguely. bit. Vaguely. <laughs> oh my God. We don't my, want to spoil too much. My mouth just like dropped open while I was doing the fight. <laughs> it oh, was like, yes. Oh, uh, what yeah. is happening here? <laughs> it was incredible. I think about it every day when I think about what is it that I like about uh, Final Fantasy 16 and it's like well I've never seen that in a game before I have never seen a boss fight that spectacular that over the top that willing to keep pushing and pushing to a new height of spectacle and to one that actually pulls off the power fantasy uh, on top of it 
I was going to say, I think the the best way to describe it without giving too much away is that it is a shonen fight. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the boss fight battles in Final Fantasy 16 evoke that same kind of knockdown, drag out, epic Sasuke versus Naruto at the falls uh, yeah. shonen anime fight that just gets you like out of your seat, like blood pressure through the roof, heart rate through the roof, like, you know, pupils fully dilated, like you are locked in. I am so invested. And that's what these fights feel like. And it is an amazing feeling. Like, I wish, I wish you could like distill that Bahamut fight. I wish you could just like distill that into some kind of medicine that you could just take if you wanted a serotonin boost, like at any time of the day. It would be just like this, the purest high that you could ever experience in (laughs) life. And that honestly is doing a lot of heavy lifting for what is otherwise a largely mediocre to not great game yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing the thing that i was going to say is like first of all i agree the, the icon battles are like incredible and and the, that's the point in this game where i'm like this is the future for this series like if they're really serious about doing an action series give me these really over the top things that make you know the the 2d games and what you felt the scale of them was like when you played them way back in the day like you know bring those to their logical conclusion this like giant giant blockbuster um and i think we all probably agree on like the action part of this where where this game is just the play of it and the combat of it is so fantastic and there's so much so much you can do with it and you know the, the combo videos i think that people are going to make with this game are, are going to be wild yeah. in terms of talking about whether or not people who love devil may cry will like it the one sticking point i have and and i think it's where Despite the fact that I like love the combat and love all the action in this game, the part where I really start to diverge from a lot of opinion on it is I think that there's a reason that something like Devil May Cry 5 is like an eight hour video game. Yeah. Like you mm. you really there is a pace for an action game. It's you know, it's it's like pacing a movie at 90 minutes, right? <laughs> where it's like, yeah, you this is the length that this thing is. Like and eight hours is such a sweet spot to show you everything, to not overdo it, to let you play with everything and get the most out of it but you know not bore you and i think trying to just take that system and put it into like a 50 i mean it took me like 50 hours to get through this game you can spend 70 on it uh, i think if you kind of 100 percent it i think that's where it starts to break down it's like if there was an editor's cut of this game that was 10 hours it was all the icon battles it was all the lead up to it man this game i would i'd be totally in agreement with everybody you know like this is this game is as good as as people are saying but it's it's that like 40 hours in between that that kind of i don't know stops me from loving it you know i'm with you on that i do think there's pacing problems in this game i also similarly took about 50 hours and i i at a certain point just stopped doing uh, the side quests because Mm -hmm. i was like this is just continuing my experience and i i think actually there is good character writing all over this game but the side quests have some of the worst writing in the game oh no (laughs) <laughs> I, I, they're just, so uh, Ash has played 14, um, yes. which shares a director uh, with 16. And Ash, you're very familiar with the repetitive and uh, you can set your watch by it questing design of that game, mm-hmm. which is you, you go somewhere, you talk to a guy, they tell you to talk to three guys, you talk to those three guys, you talk to the same guy again, and then you go somewhere and you kill three monsters, and then you talk to that guy again, and then you go somewhere else and you collect three things, and then you talk to that guy again, and yeah. then the quest is over. And that's how every single quest in this game is. When you had to collect sand for mid, I wanted oh, to God, scream. <laughs> Jesus Christ, yep. There's a sand collecting quest in this game. There is a, that's part of the main quest line too. That's not even a sand, a side quest. It, here at Insert Credit, we're very big fans of Final Fantasy 15. That's like our modern Final Fantasy because of the uh, hangoutitude of the game, which is a thing we yeah. talk about a lot with RPGs. What you want to do in an RPG is you want to kind of crawl in and live in the world and hang out in it. And yeah. uh, have an excuse to just like explore it for a while. But it feels like 16 isn't that kind of game. Am I wrong? Not at all. No, not at all. It no. is not. It's really sad. They just don't give you time to hang out with the characters. And I kind of like the characters. I wanted to hang out with them too. I wanted to hang out with more with Sid for sure. Hey, for and I also, definite. Uh, Sid is amazing. <laughs> I love him. He's the best Sid in any Final Fantasy incarnation. Like the only one that comes maybe close second is Final Fantasy VII Sid. Like yeah. he is the best Sid. I don't know. I'm a real big fan of Final Fantasy IV Sid. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. That, <laughs> that little dwarf dude. Yeah, but, I uh, mean, if, if that guy's not telling you to sit down and drink your fucking tea, then it doesn't count. <laughs> but 
Yeah, there's, and the, the thing is, is that they they give you these characters that you fall in love with and then immediately shunt them off somewhere else and you never get to hang out with them. That's horrible. And they give you really nice moments with them, like within a cutscene, but then, you know, they fuck off and they're never seen again. I'm thinking of Dion in speci- yeah. specifically oh my God, when you- Dion. Yeah, when you- get him for the the first time like oh he's like oh okay cool they're not doing that thing where i you know what i'm not gonna even say that because I, I don't know what the spoiler <laughs> not is. yet not yet we're gonna come yeah. up to a spoiler break soon yeah that is the most damning thing you could have said about the game to me because without that is is it even a final fantasy anymore what i really was hoping for would be there would be a moment where the game opens up there's two specific moments where the game is like do these side quests and then get back to the main plot Mm -hmm. and i was hoping at one of those moments i would get a chance to choose my party and then just walk around with them and get the same kind of banter that you'd get in like uh uh, dragon's age inquisition which Mm -hmm. was Oh, one yeah. of my one of my favorite things in that game was just changing my party up just to see how people would talk to each other. And Absolutely. It, it just doesn't materialize. It's like these these characters really do feel like they exist behind glass. And the yeah. game does not want me to be around them unless they have a specific narrative purpose. And it really, I mean, it's a shame because I also was hoping for those moments for the game to open up because I wanted to hang out with these characters and use my powers more to practice with them. But they really encourage you rather to sort of practice uh, in an open world or in the open areas of the map, I should say. It's definitely not an open world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they encourage you to practice in practice rooms rather than to practice against mobs. Mobs don't scale the level with you. So you end up just fighting these mobs that are like level 11 while you're level 35. Yeah. A lot of what we're talking about kind of comes back to the core problem I think I have with the game and, and why I ended up being not as huge on it. I like it for, for the record. I, I think it's it's good. The action part of it is very fun and satisfying in like a Hollywood blockbuster way where I'm like, well, turn I guess turn the brain off for the other 40 hours. Um, but the problem for me is that like, I just think it's really bad at delivering payoff. Yeah. In in a lot of ways, like in story payoff um, in, in things like that, where you're expecting, oh, they're, they're going to they're going to give me a moment with these characters and it, it never happens. And even going back to the side quests, you know, the, the side quests themselves are rough, but it would be tolerable if there was a payoff for doing them. But the rewards for the side quests are so meaningless and useless that it's like, well, these weren't worth doing either. And and that's yeah. what it is for me. I feel like I invested so much, especially because the introduction to it is so strong. You know, the first three hours is, is that like tight, almost like yeah. movie like opening. And then you have. It, like it kind of follows up on that and it just never pays anything off and, and i think we'll get to that more in the story where things kind of fall apart but mm-hmm. I, I think it's present in the gameplay too where i just i no, kept waiting right. for things to happen that never happen like so many of the rewards for quests are either gill or items that you can sell for gill but you almost never have to buy anything i i don't know if this was either your experience at yes. Astro Geo, but i would like go to the store just to you know see what was in there and then all you do is buy the highest rated weapon and then go to the blacksmith and have them upgrade it to plus mm-hmm. two and then there's nothing for you to buy i had like a yeah. hundred thousand gil by the end of the game oh you just- i hate that don't have to buy anything. I think that's why they make the orchestrion songs as expensive as they are, because mm-hmm. they realized a little bit too late, like, oh, shit, there's really nothing you can do with all this money that you've accumulated. So we have to give something that incentivizes using it so it doesn't feel wasted, which is why, like, if you want to buy, like, the orchestrion, if you don't know, is like a, a feature from Final Fantasy XIV that allows you to play, like, music from the game in, like, the little hub area. And you can buy them at certain shops all over the world. And they're like, well, they're ridiculously expensive. They're like 40000 50000 yeah. whatever. And you have no other use for your money other than that. Like if you want the highest level weapons, you have to do some quests and you have to kill some hunts. And then they'll give you the materials that you need to, to do that. And like after a certain point in the game, like you just don't buy weapons anymore. You don't need to because your most powerful weapons are going to be the ones that you make. And so, like, yeah, it's it's like a waste. Yeah, and yeah. again, it's like everything you're doing is rewarding you gill or crafting materials. And like, yeah, I had I had such a glut because you can't spend them on items because you're capped at like you know six mm-hmm. potions or whatever for like most yep. of the game. Like, you you cannot hoard items if you want. And then it's like, oh, okay, I'll go explore this world, which there's no reason to explore because it's like you found two gill, and it's like I have a hundred thousand. I don't I don't need this. <laughs> uh, it's it's really really weird the way that they like underplay the RPG systems to the point 
you know, and, and I don't mind that. I don't mind taking the RPG out of the game if you want to make a pure action game. But for me, it's like, then just don't put that stuff in there at all because what's left is like the bones of a system without any of the reward or reason that you do that stuff in a game. And and that just like kills a lot of the game for me where I'm like, I just don't want to go do anything because anytime I go off and like wander on the beaten path or do a side quest, I'm like, that was such a waste of time. Why did I do that? I found exactly one thing that was cool while wandering and the game made no indication that this existed elsewhere. Um, <laughs> what was it? After I beat one of the hunts, one of the... Garuda has those two uh, other girlies and then one of yeah. them is just... Yeah, so I beat her and then I wandered around in that corner because I was, I don't know, just wanted to see if there was anything over there. And I found uh, another Aret stone. So Aret stones are the the thing in the hub oh, yeah, yeah. world that allow mm -hmm. you to access replaying levels and the practice mode. I mm. found an Aret stone that had a challenge mode where they would give you specific powers and you'd have to, um, you know, defeat a horde of enemies under a time limit and doing specific things gave you more time in the next section. And I, I only found that once. And I was like, am I really going to have to scour every inch of this worthless map to find another one of these? Oh, no. I only found, Ugh. okay, I know what you're talking about. I only found one, too. I don't know if we found the same one because mine had the, the challenge of the Phoenix in it. So yeah. I don't know if we found the same one. But yeah, I that was like another disappointing aspect about the RPG elements of the game. There's like no reward for expo exploration like i'm very diablo brained in that i want to uncover or tears of the kingdom brain too either i just want to uncover the entire map and see what is in all the hidden nicks and crannies and there was one area where i was like oh this is a little offshoot of a place that i've already been before but it was locked off previously let me see what's behind there and usually what's there is a hunt that i did not like set up on my board or whatever or nothing yeah and i and the other thing about that is that there's no reward for exploration. Like usually in Final Fantasy games, like if you go to a place, you can run into somebody who will give you a side quest and you can go on this neat little bespoke tiny adventure with you and your friends and, you know, discover something, kill a boss, you know, get some things, improve this little corner of the world. But they've removed even that like explorationness of it by having these little pips on the map that tells you there's a side quest here and there's a side quest here, which is fine because, you know, but they also make it so that you don't even have to leave your hub to get access to these side quests because there's a thing where Clive can go in his like little room and he'll get letters from people and the letters will tell him like, this this side quest is here, go do this, this side quest is here, go do this, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, what's even the point? Yeah. Oh, there's the, uh, that guy also that has the uh, allied up reports where if you mm -hmm. just talk to him, he's like, oh, there's some guys who want you to do something over here. And then it's all on your map, too. And it's just like, I hate this. But sorry, go <laughs> ahead, Jaffe. Uh, yeah, uh, to me, this sounds a lot like the problem a lot of people had with Final Fantasy 13, where the entire game kind of had this hallway design that discouraged any kind of exploration. And this game seems to have a larger map but no reason to actually explore it counterpoint that did happen in 13 but there was eventually a point where they let you off the rails and let you go 16 never lets you go yeah, yeah. basically any optional nook and cranny in this world only exists for something to happen in once you trigger a subquest or a hunt or something and then yeah. there will be nothing in it before that and there will be nothing in it after that so yeah i like i kept walking around and being like cool like let's find some stuff and you soon learn the language of the game is like this is an open area but it's not i mean like you are you are truly wasting your time if you do that just find the quest and you'll get to every corner of this map at some point which maybe people will like that that's fine but like why have the illusion of an open area if if it's not at least like put some environmental storytelling do the do the bethesda thing and put a skeleton on a toilet somewhere so i can be like <laughs> oh what happened here but like there's there's not even that it's it's pretty wild yeah. Speaking of storytelling, is there anything we want to say more about the game before we go on to uh, break open the seal? Design-wise, I find a lot of the combat really, really clean. It makes a lot of sense, and it is laid out to you in a way that is, makes it perfectly understandable, even though it is so complex. But the one thing I hate so much about this game is the upgrade system. It is truly mm. there just to be there. Ability point, you could remove ability points and just have everything fully upgraded, and it would not make a single ounce of difference. It feels like another way that the game is trying to get you to do stuff but not give you a satisfying reward for it. I mean, for instance, you know, the final upgrade on every single iconic ability you have is it doesn't make it more powerful. It just allows you to bind it to any icon. 
I'm like, why doesn't that come default? I'm so sorry. That's really dumb. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's very frustrating. It feels like this game has a linear progression system like an action game and they kind of try and like hide it from you and they're like "Ooh, you have choices and it's like no i don't there's only one most powerful weapon at any given time there's only one most powerful piece of gear you know it's just there's no actual progression and again i wouldn't mind i really wouldn't if this was just actually an action game but so much of the stuff here feels like it's out of obligation to be like to the name people are gonna, yeah people are gonna expect this from a final fantasy game and it's like i don't know maybe just like like maybe let's just stop using the name then like i don't know maybe we could just end the series at that point i was gonna finish up by saying like the the thing with the side quests where everything is laid out before you and then because everything is so like consequenceless and nothing but like the side quests some of them are okay, I guess, and some of them are really, really tedious. And it kind of, and then you eventually, because you experience this so much, you get to a point where it's like, well, there's no point, right? There's no point in doing any of these side quests unless they're the little plus ones that give Clive some kind of like upgrade, like makes his potions more powerful or gives him more potion inventory or whatever. But that works against it because then there are quests that you will want to do that have some story significance in a minor way that you'll never see because you just you have been conditioned up until that point to just like ignore them because they are so bland. Like I'm thinking of there's a there's a quest with that involves Torgal, your dog. And there was a really, really sweet touching moment about it that otherwise I would have missed because I do everything re- regarding the dog because um spoiler alert, not, not to bring the mood down, mm-hmm. but during, you know, playing and the 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 game for the review, I had to put my own dog to sleep. So I'm like really sensitive about dog stuff. And so anytime I see anything about Torgal popped up, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. And it, what ended up happening was it was this really nice quest where you and Torgal go alone to this like little island and you learn a little bit more about what Torgal was doing in like the time jump between when you first meet him and when we meet up with Clive again. And it was so sweet and it was so nice. And it was such a nice little bit of character development that I wish was in more of the side quests for this game that I would have completely missed because the absolute chaff the rest of the side yeah. quests were yeah. you're so right about the game conditioning you not to play side quests i also would have missed that torkel side quest and i did it just because torkel's like low-key my favorite character <laughs> torkel yeah. is yeah. very well characterized and i love him all right let's talk a lot more about that i'm breaking open the seal all of these sections of this show are time stamped so if you are spoiler averse you'll know by consulting the show notes when this discussion begins and ends uh, let's talk about the story. Whew. Uh, I'll I'll start on the general note because I think a lot of the details of this story go in and out uh, one ear for reasons that I think we'll we'll mm. get into. The thing that I will say is that what's disappointing about the story for me is it goes back to the payoff issue that I was talking about. Those first three hours of the game set up a really strong story, right? It sets up this clear revenge story. You understand Clive's motivations. Uh, you understand his his character arc as it gets into like the second act of the game where it's like he's kind of trying to push ahead and be his own person, but he's held back by the past and he kind of has to deal with this. And there was just a lot of like really relatable stuff in there that I could really chew into. And I think that's what a lot of people were responding to in the demo, you know, being like, I'm so gripped. I'm, I'm so in on this. And there is a point where the game is just like, okay, anyways, yeah, so that happened. Now on to the kingdom battle. And you're like, what? And then it's like, just kidding. Here's the real big bad. He's the White Walker from Game of Thrones. And you're like, what <laughs> happened? Like, what, yeah. what's going on? And like, it just, there's, it never pays off a story thread because it just like, finishes one and then is like here's the next thing and you're like okay cool i guess i'll get invested in this and it's like don't get too invested slavery is not a big deal and you're like what's <laughs> happening it really you, there really is a moment in the game where you can feel it stop being interested in the i mean it's not that complex but the relatively yeah. complex political situation that they've spent that and up until that moment a lot of time setting up for you and then suddenly you meet the ultimate villain who is ultima and uh all of that goes out the window and it's just becomes a story about killing god and i usually like it in rpgs when you kill god but i had a lot of other questions about all of the things that i spent all that time doing and they never get resolved Gita, i'm gonna take a guess as to the moment where you stop caring about the story it's when they kill the cersei analog isn't it oh my god <laughs> i okay i have a lot of things to say about 
the racial approach in this in this game, uh, which Dash and I have chatted about a little bit. <laughs> but I also just want to give a shout out to the like, like it's writing of women that is so retrograde. I was kind of shocked. Oh my God. Like, um, so there's two women that look identical. They're both sexy yes. blondes, and the yes. only reason they get ever for their motivations is because, um. They're evil because they're evil, essentially. Like, <laughs> yep. um, the Cersei analog is Clive's mother. And Clive outright asks her, like, why did you treat me like shit, but you love my younger brother? And she was like, oh, because I'm evil. I'm evil because I'm evil. And then also those two women go insane before and they then die. die yeah. And then nothing yeah. happens. And then the only woman that gets to hold power in this game, Jill, and not lose her mind, she's the only one. <laughs> And the reason why she gets to not lose her mind by the end is because she gives her she power gives up away. Her powers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <It> was, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was truly like they took the complaint from Final Fantasy 15 where people were like, hey, there were like no female characters. And they were like, well, you're going to hate when we actually put them in the game. <laughs> it's like, <Yeah>. okay, <laughs> okay. I may, maybe this is why you didn't write them in the first place, but maybe you should hire other people to, to write then. Yeah. And to give them more than what we were given. Because I honestly, I think that uh, the women characters in the game were actually kind of well done i i hate the way that the game treats them yeah. because if we got more time with them i think they would have made for really strong characters especially benedicta yeah especially jill because jill is so flat in one note and it's really sad because there are a lot of interesting things about her that kind of get addressed but don't yeah. especially like with her time and in, in the iron islands I, okay number one problems with jill I mean, let's go character by character and talk about like what <laughs> makes them flat and the potential that they had. But with Jill, there is that one chapter of development she has where she's like, by the way, Clive, before we do anything else, I have to kill my abuser. And Clive is like, oh, okay. <laughs> then, you, <laughs> then you just do. And Clive was like, are you, uh, is that going to backfire on us in any way? And she's like, no, killing my abuser is good. And I was like, good for you. <laughs> um, but there is like this, after that period of time, she just stops developing there and mm. you yep. stop hearing about what her life is like it she's also begins the game literally as a political prisoner and she seems to have no opinions on that whatsoever so as a child she was taken from her family to ensure peace between two warring territories and she just doesn't ever talk about that and i feel like that character would have something to say <laughs> but I don't know. Um, yeah. I know that's like how they do it in Game of Thrones, where Theon Nev Greyjoy never has anything to say about, you know, being a Greyjoy, but living among the Starks. But also Theon Greyjoy has a lot of shit going on, you know, and Jill just and doesn't. And to explore a little bit of that when he does his little heel turn against yeah. the, the Starks later in the series. Yeah, yeah. Jill just yeah. doesn't get that. And it's a real, it feels missing especially after she loses her powers and she stops doing anything in the game. It feels like she just stopped. They had one thing they wanted to do with her and then it just stopped. And Ash, I also totally agree with you about Benedicta, who they set up as like a, a sexy lady doing it for themselves, you know? And she ends up getting slut saved by a We know nothing sit. about her. <laughs> and we know nothing about her. And then she goes crazy and then she dies. <laughs> Benedicta, especially because we know that she had a relationship with Sid. We know something happened and that caused her to jump ship over to Barnabas. We don't know why. We don't know why. <laughs> that is never explored. That's never answered. We don't know what it was. And then at the end of her life, we get this like last little glimpsing moment where she's like, oh, I'm alone and I wish somebody would love me. And then Sid comes up and, you know, saves her. Like, how does she fumble the best man in the twins? Like, <laughs> what, what happened The only there? man that knows that slavery is wrong. <laughs> fumble the back. Oh, God. I, I part of it. I wonder if part of it is has to do with like the structure of this game. We were talking about the kind of lack of a party system and how you're never like really walking around with people. And I I wonder if that's just like where that stuff should have happened, right? Where you got these loose conversations with Jill that made her feel like a character. Because what ends up happening is that she's plopped into the story whenever she's relevant, and like whatever arc she has just becomes its own like bottle episode within Final Fantasy 16 of like, hey, let's check in on Jill, and she's like, cool. Here's how I'm feeling. Clive's like, cool, 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 cool. Thanks. I 
have to go kill God now. And she's like, great, I'll see you later. Like, it, it just feels like there's this revolving door for the cast members in the game yeah. where it's just like, yeah. here's this person's turn to have like one scene and then they're and then they're gone. I don't know. Yeah. And maybe maybe this would have worked as a TV show. Maybe they were trying to structure it too much like a TV show. But like, you know, it, it just it just doesn't. I, don't know. I would remark to my partner that it felt like I was being dropped into the fourth season of a television show and I didn't know what was going on. Mm, That's what it yeah. feels like. It feels like they were going for understated, but what they did was just not explain anything. Not state. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not understated, not just unstated. lack of state. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I remember, and, and then the stuff that does get explained gets explained in the fucking in-game wiki, and that made me <laughs> The bonkers. active lore system. I want to oh talk Which about this. Which is a great system. It's a very cool system, yep. and I did read every single entry, and I thought the ones that added depth rather than explaining character motivations were well-written and interesting, right? Mm. I, I loved hearing about Moss the Chronicler, which is such a Game of Thrones ass thing. Just to, <laughs> of course, you know, <laughs> Moss the Chronicler. But I, I really liked learning about like deep lore of Valistea, and like I liked knowing that and feeling like this world had existed long beyond this conflict. But what I didn't like was, uh, so the the Sampaqua, uh Emperor menaces. I mentioned this in the review. He menaces. He's, he keeps. He's always holding this flower. And I think some people who read my review didn't understand what I meant by this, but I only had, I was already 400 words over my word count when I submitted my draft. So <laughs> he has this flower. When I first saw that, I was like, I wonder what's up with that flower. Hopefully he'll speak aloud and talk about that flower. No. But every scene that he's in, he's always got this flower and he's giving it to people. The camera pans over this flower. and It's like very significant, clearly. But you don't know anything about the flower. It is also not a flower that exists in the real world. So I can't okay. draw any information about it from outside sources. The only place that you learn that that flower is like the national flower of the Sambrek Empire is in the wiki. And it kills me that not a character could have said that. <laughs> A character could have just said that out loud so that everybody watching the scene could know why it was so important and significant to the scene. And there are many tiny little pieces where it's like they they want to make it more subtle by just taking out necessary information for the players to know and putting them elsewhere. They really tried to do like un, uh, the North remembers, but... One of the key things that Game of Thrones does is that they repeat those words, the North remembers, the North remembers, mm -hmm. and gives us context. Like, this is the words of House Stark. When you say this shit, you are invoking House Stark. Yeah. So in season whatever, when Arya rips off her mask and stabs Walter Frey in the heart and goes, the North fucking remembers, we're like, yes, 100%. Pay off. And that's what they were going for, but they did not do enough foundation setting yeah. for you to get that, like, explicitly. Not in the text explicitly, but, like, explicitly explaining that to the viewer and it was very that payoff just wasn't there even though they tried to like this is the payoff this is the payoff it's not there yeah, yeah it, it reminds me of like uh, the way they dole the story out through the active time lord and whatnot reminds me kind of of like destiny one when they were doing like the grimoire yes. in that game where they were like hey there's a lot of story in this game open your open your telephone app to look at the backstory behind this gun that's really cool. And you're like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> that's kind of how the entire game feels. We're like, yeah, there's like cool stuff. But like, man, this game's already pretty long. And like characters are talking a lot of lore at me. And you want me to sit and read more lore? Like, I come on. You could have used one of these conversations to tell me the cool thing that's relevant to the plot, right? Ash, you're a big Bioware fan. How much of the in-game codex do you read? Oh, I read all of it. So when does it, how does a game encourage you to do that, to engage with its lore in that way? Yeah, interesting question, because I think we're talking about two different things and how Bioware implements its lore for Dragon Age and how Square Enix has done this active time lore for Final Fantasy 16. Like if active time lore was just a thing to remind you the who, what, where's and the when's and flesh out like deeper things about the world more than just info dumps, because the fantastic, beautiful thing about uh, Bioware codexes is that they give you things like art they give you poems they give you songs they give you you know that that world's equivalent of bible verses yeah. and it all adds like this extra rich addition to the game so you feel like thetis don't laugh about thetis i know we bring this up every time that thetis stands for the dragon age whatever <laughs> um, so funny. it just <laughs> adds more flavor to that world where the act of time lore thing does that but in a much more straightforward much more 
like yeah. less rich way. That is great if you just need something quick to reference to remember who that is or where that is. But it's not so great when you need to reference it to understand, okay, oh, that's why the San Bukwa emperor or whatever did that or some stuff like that. Like I would have appreciated it more if it had done so I could get an idea of what I'm dealing with with these two com uh, continents. So, you know, we can we can know about customs and traditions and shit like that versus, you know, the the history of slavery in this world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because that, that richness is an enticement to, to continue to read because there's so many little things that you can – learn that unlocks something like oh okay i understand that versus active time lore which is like this is a nice encyclopedia there is yeah. no color here i think a great example of this is when you meet uncle byron which the game also oh, has my a God. bad Favorite tendency moment. of like saying things like uh uh revealing that characters had relatives literally right before you meet them where it's like i feel like I feel like Clive would have mentioned this uncle, sh should have mentioned this uncle, <laughs> like before we meet him, but whatever. I love the moment where you meet him and they mm -hmm. act out that play. But oh, what God. I wish was that we knew what that play was before that scene. Even just the name, the saint in the sectary, you know? But you yeah. only ever get an entry about it in the wiki after that scene. And that, to me, it feels like I just went to that scene a little confused and then needed the wiki for an explanation rather than getting excited about something because I read it in the wiki and I feel like now I finally get to see something that I've only read about. I love that moment for the exact reason you describe. I thought of it as a different way. I thought this was a nice nod to Final Fantasy fans who have been with the series for a long time, because there are a lot of moments in other Final Fantasy games where they reference like in world plays. I'm thinking I want to be your canary. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Loveless from Final Fantasy seven. And the minute that I saw like Clive like start to act out, I'm like, oh, they're doing the this universe is equivalent of I want to be your canary. I'm 100 percent all in. I know what this is. I recognize this. Yeah. Yes. 100 yeah. percent. Perfect. Yeah, I just wish that, you know, it's about setup and payoff, which I think is yeah. a major problem with the plot. I I liked that that was written in that way. I liked that it was a call back towards other Final Fantasy things. And I liked that that was how Clive proved to his uncle that he was who he said he was by invoking their memories. I just wish I was a little bit more on the inside of that moment. Mm. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. I wish that I could have perked up and said oh it's the state in the sectary i've just read about this like i sometimes do when i'm playing dragon age on the other hand i love uncle byron uh, uncle byron is so oh, good absolutely. best <laughs> yes. character one of the best characters one of the only guys having a good time <laughs> just, like good the time. game desperately needed <laughs> Gav or Gaz or Gav, I can't remember what his name is. Gav is also one of my favorite characters in, and he came from an unlooked for place because he's also having a lot of fun and has yes. a lot of heart behind him. Yes. And it ended up being way more developed than I thought they would have done for him. So he's he's cool. He can stay. Same with Karen, uh, the, the surly uh, oh, item yeah. seller. She's fun. This has been bothering me, and I just want to say it real quick. There's like a big chunk of this game where they're like, we're going to build a ship. And you spend like hours building a ship, and it's like, oh, man, you're going to get this ship. And then it just like... It exists. Yeah, it does not exist, like does not have any bearing on the plot. And it's just like, that's the whole... That moment is the whole game in a nutshell for me, where it gets me excited about something, and it's like, oh, what's this going to do? Like, am I going to get like an airship? Like, is this going to be like a thing I get to do mechanically? And then like, it's it's nothing. It's just something that's filling time. And to me, so much of the story is like that beat over and over and over again where i'm like yeah. okay maybe this one will pay off into something and it's like no 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 I mean, it's, it's not <laughs> it starts from the very beginning of the game with the slavery thing which has been discussed yes. ad nauseum but the game sets up this system this economic system where every single nation in valisea except for the one where they murder all the magic users it requires magical slaves to function and it is i i don't even want to fucking get into it honestly but it's like should be obvious to everyone that it, these kinds of fantasy stories have been told a ton of times and if you're gonna tell a story like this without the perspective of the enslaved people that you're describing you're making a specific choice and one choice that has it, it used to be more popular pre-1960 and then after 1960 had became less popular for reasons i'm sure you can extrapolate <laughs> but the game sets all of this up and sets it up as a huge central conflict to the story. And then eventually there's just no payoff for it whatsoever. Eventually it ceases mattering because you've literally destabilized every single world government in Valisthea. So it kind of <laughs> doesn't matter if anyone's enslaved or not. Right. Here's my maybe blasphemous question. 
Uh, it seems like the best part of this game is the bombastic fight sequences that are right in your path that you encounter no matter what. Uh, if you just hammer through and speed run this game, skip the cutscenes, mash through the dialogue, just get to the next fight, is that the best way to enjoy this game? Oh, no. And I'm going to tell you why. And it's because of Ralph Innocent yes, and Ben I was, Starr. I was going to say the same shit. I'm so, I'm so mad that the performances are so good. But mm -hmm. especially in the beginning when it's Ralph Innocent and Ben Starr, like, quipping back and forth to each other, their scenes together are fun. And I do like them. And I think Ben Starr should get cast in fucking everything after this. He's amazing. He's yeah. really good. I think you play you play through the first like eight hours of the game and you let all the cutscenes roll and you have fun. And as soon as you get to like the third act jump, I feel like there you can maybe start <laughs> start skipping around a little bit. Uh, I like that. And, which is maybe like, you know, 30 hours of game. Um, but that first eight hours, no, don't skip that stuff. That's where the good stuff is. That's where all the that's where all the good stuff that doesn't come back or pay off is. What yep. you're telling me is the equivalent of like, oh man, this show is really good until you get to season four, then absolutely stop watching. Oh, it's exactly yeah. like that. They've yep. recreated a television watching experience that used to be more common, right? <laughs> where <Yeah. laughs> a show goes on for like 10 seasons and you're like, well, the first three are pretty, are pretty fucking great, but the the like the last seven aren't good at all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i i really bought into ben Starr's performance i really bought into his relationship with his brother joshua i really felt that like he made me feel that i really got into uh sid and his like whole like freedom fighting quest or whatever like those parts of the game i really appreciated which is why i couldn't bring myself to skip like cutscenes, I'll mash through some fucking text though when uh, <laughs> Sid has to like talk to people because nothing of value is ever said there. <laughs> so true. But like, there are parts of the story that are worth seeing them play out, and one of those moments is is definitely like the whole Clive and Joshua thing. And I'm, if we're talking about spoilers, I'm kind of upset because there is like kind of like Jill. Joshua is a little underdeveloped because, um, you know, spoiler alert: Joshua's not dead. He comes back, and then. We don't know what happened to him in those, like, 13 years <laughs> that he was gone. He literally never tells us. He, we know that he was with some, like, shadow cabal organization, but that's it. We get no insight into anything that happened to him whatsoever, except that he has, like, a cool ride-or-die shield person that I wish they gave more screen time to. Listen, I'm going to be on AO3. I want to see what people come up with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just one more thing. I... I don't mean to shade Yoshi P too much, but Naoki Yoshida, you did say the story would be complete on launch, and it doesn't feel that way for reasons like that Ash just just said. It hmm. seems like they went for understated, but it really comes off as just unexplained. There's a lot more story here, and I, I feel cheated as a player for not having a chance to see what characters are up to when they're not literally right in front of my eyes. Oh god, are we gonna get a Final Fantasy fifteen version where all the DLC is like the intervening years where we figure oh. out what Joshua was doing for all that time and what Clive was doing for that five year gap in the second act jump? Like Yoshiki was kind of implying that he wouldn't do that by saying that statement, but it feels like there are many points in the game where they could release story DLC that explains what happened to the characters. Yeah, and and you know, not to not to discredit Yoshi P, but also before the game came out, he did say it's a grounded fantasy, <laughs> which which <laughs> d didn't exactly end up being true because you do fight God and and go to space, but you know. Yeah, uh, man. So the Bahamut fight, you fucking go to space. You turn into a, dra a demon and you punch a dragon in the face. I wanted to run around my apartment. I was so fucking excited. Fucking hi, dude. That was oh so. God good i was like i it was one of those like i can't believe we're doing this no there's no way we're doing this we're not now doing that this sounds devil may cry right <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely there's a there's a boss fight against titan where like there's like a sonic the hedgehog section where you're like running down a half pipe oh like, i love that part and oh and like, the music uh, during the titan fight is oh, the best in the game amazing it's yeah. so and, good and, and that's another thing like we have been talking so much shit about this game that would probably turn off like your average casual player who was like nah I don't want to do this this isn't for me but then at the same time we have to go no you should play this game and it is because of Ben Star, Ralph Innocent the fights and fucking Masayoshi Soken because holy oh, my shit God. without yeah. that soundtrack this game is nothing it's those so true. fights are not 
nearly as epic as they, we make them sound without that soundtrack. When the choral arrangements start coming in, there's oh, just- Oh, you know shit's oh, real. Oh my god. I reminded- <laughs> Shit is happening. Tim Rogers once told me that there were certain points in the first God of War game where he would just shout a load as a barb and, yeah! And that's how I felt when I would hear the choral arrangements <laughs> going off. <laughs> when Yosh, when, when Soken, like, when Latin is getting spoken, oh, you know Lord. you are about to get fucked up or something <laughs> When fuck they bring up. Latin in, you know shit's gonna be off the fucking chain. Uh, so we are all pro-Final Fantasy Latin here. Yes. Oh. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and, I agree. and you know what? We, we've been we've been like trash talking a lot, or not trash talking, criticizing. I, I think healthily parts of this game, but I, I think we I think we all agree on some level that like the blockbuster parts of it, the like turn your brain off, like fun video game entertaining escapist parts of it are are really good. You know, oh, and, and I get yeah. why people are loving it because of that. Because if you're someone who's just a pure gameplay person, yeah, there's there's so much good spectacle here and and the action is so rewarding and those boss fights are incredible and the music and the aesthetic and, and everything it it depends on how much you get invested in all the other stuff it throws at you which is a lot of other stuff to be fair i, I i've been saying it reminds me this is the worst comparison that i'm ever going to make in my life and I, I, i'm so sorry it reminds me of the first time i saw them the only time i saw the film mortal engines anybody remember mortal oh my god mortal that, yeah. engines that's a, that's a wild movie <laughs> it's it's so it's not good and this game is obviously better but like oh the one with the moving cities i remember this it's about moving cities and like a friend dragged me to it because like he was hyped about it and i remember like the story is nonsense and i don't remember any characters i don't remember anything that happens in it but damn anytime the city of london came up on screen as a mech and was like fighting like germany i was like yeah and and that's like this game for me is my is my mortal (laughs) engines where i'm like those moments that got me hyped up they did it. They got me hyped up. That's cinema, baby. You know, I, That's I, cinema. I was going to compare it in, to my, in my review, and I, I ended up not having enough room in it to make this metaphor work. But it's like Michael Bay. Michael mm. Bay is not interested in human beings. He is interested in creating a level of spectacle that I do not think any other filmmaker can achieve. Uh, Transformers movies are all garbage. That's true. But if you look at the fight scenes in isolation, I don't know if any other person could direct those in the world. Totally. It and, just and the, can't. The, the icon battles, this is the thing that like drives me nuts. Um, the icon battles have storytelling to them. Like yeah. those 30 yes. minute fights, there is a, a story and there are power dynamics that are communicated through gameplay and through like their incredible animations. And like, I wish they just had the confidence to be like, let's just tell the story through these and, and yeah. you'll get those parts through it. But instead, you know, we get these incredible moments that feel groundbreaking and feel like genuinely like, like what a video game kind of should do, you know, in, in terms of how the special ways they can tell stories. And then that's saddled down with like, here's your 10th subquest where you talk to three people and then go back and get more lore. And that's just where it's like, guys, you got something here. You got something here. Just yeah. like, just have confidence. Yeah. I felt like by the end of the game, if they just let this be an action game and just let go of all the RPG stuff, it would have been better. Yeah, I agree. I want to ask one more question. Should Final Fantasy games be attempting to portray mature themes at all? They've done it before, though. It, you know, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they did it. Uh, they did it well. I mean, like several times. Ten is a, it, beneath its sort of CW esque, you know, presentation of the story, which I enjoy because I genuinely enjoy CW shows. Uh, <laughs> it has a very meaningful story about orthodoxy and religion and actually tries to examine it from all angles and uh, 12 is similarly i think some of the stuff near the end falls apart but they actually portray a political conflict with a a great amount of nuance even when they get silly with it i feel like they do a better job of trying to actually nail its themes it just feels like this one was so focused on being mature in a very specific way being mature meaning hbo you know prestige television show which Worked very well for Naughty Dog, I will say, but does not necessarily work for this genre. Yeah, I mean, Final Fantasy has just always been playful, and it, and it has always been serious, and it's balanced that seriousness with its silliness, and I think that's what people, that's what made it special. Um, mm. there, there are very few Final Fantasy games, if any, where I'm like, I think of that game and I'm like, oh, that game's like this game, uh, you know, or, or like this other thing. And this, to me, is the first Final Fantasy game where I'm like, oh, this is like Devil May Cry, or this is like, um, you know, this is like Game of Thrones. I, I just think that it it tries too hard to look at other things and mimic what other things are doing instead of 
really looking at what Final Fantasy does well, which is that weird balance between being playful and silly and still mature. And and you see that in like Final Fantasy VII and, and, and the remake, especially where it's so goofy. You fight a house, you fight hell house in the game, but you also get these like really deep and well thought out themes and like meditations about destiny and free will and what it means to break away from those things and like eco terrorism. And it's, it's balanced in really well. And, and I think the mistake they do here is just thinking that, they can't still do the fun stuff like that. You can't have a, a walking cactus and do that stuff. And it's like, no, you can, you've always done it. Um, and, and I think that's what is like missing for me tonally. Like I, they could totally have told this story, but they don't seem to be having fun doing it. Yeah. Well, it's what a child would think a mature story is like, yes. because there's a lot of, you know, fucks and cocks and sex position without actual sex that, you know, move forward nothing but just like oh the specter of titties and um, that's great <laughs> ghost titties <laughs> it is like that though there's like sex worker characters in the game and they don't even talk about like the sex workers don't talk about having sex you know they you, the characters don't refer to the sex workers you know even in uh, problematic terms right like there's no acknowledgement of what their actual profession is but they keep talking about brothels who were misses but it feels like a 1970s body english sex comedy it more than an actual mature discussion of sex, sexuality, the role of sex in hum human life. You know, it makes me think about Six a lot. But Six is a game that has, I think, yes. the mm. most mature expression of loss in the entire series where oh, yeah. you lose and then you have to live with your loss in the world after. But guess who's the villain of, of Final Fantasy VI? A freaking clown who thinks it's crimes the are good. They <laughs> just joke, put the baby. Joker in that game. <laughs> You know, like Final Fantasy is a is a, a game series that at its best says we will make you cry while you're fighting a, a, an evil clown, you know, and, and this game did not have the evil clown element that I needed. Yeah, totally agree. Ah, that's absolutely it. Yes. Final Fantasy has been doing mature themes for decades. It's just you need to temper it. Mm -hmm. You need Blitzball, it turns out. <laughs> Any last thoughts about this nightmare story before we move on? I, I I'm really upset that the game kind of plays with your emotions uh, with regards to Dion. Ugh, um, yeah, they mm. Dion is like the Bahamut icon before Clive takes his powers, and um, he might be like the first explicit in-game confirmed gay character. Like I know that the developers have said things about Fang and Vanille after the fact, but Dion is confirmed. Yeah. by the game yeah. in his actions and in the lore as a homosexual and so when you fight him after the first time you're like oh he's dead okay so we did the kill your gays thing but oh wait he's not dead he goes away and then you think like oh god you know every time you see him you get scared that you're thinking oh god they're gonna kill him they're gonna kill him we're gonna bury your gays and then every time he like comes out of a scrape you're like oh thank god and so they finally <laughs> actually do it yes! and i'm like son of a bitch <laughs> it really was like that for me too i was like oh my god they're actually doing it he's actually gay oh they're my god gonna i'm gonna kill him and then he's gonna die oh he's alive oh he's alive oh he's gonna die oh he's gonna die we're not he's doing alive this. they're finally doing something different yeah and then they're like finally 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 like no we're not doing we're not gonna be different with this he's dead don't play chicken with gay people with me okay <laughs> <laughs> Let them live. It reminded me so much of uh, ha of Game of Thrones, the House of the Dragon. Uh, if spoilers if you haven't seen the specific episode, but I'll explain, explain in broad strokes. There's a character who's gay, and other characters realize that he needs to go out of the picture. Rather than kill him, they have his lover kidnap him and take him across the sea so they can live out their lives in anonymity together. And every other character, including his parents, thinks he's dead. So you get to have the emotional weight of other characters believing this character is dead and the uh, intensity of a death of a character. But simultaneously, this gay character gets to live freely. I wish that we had gotten that level of respect for Dion. And I just don't feel like the narrative respected him that much. And they do a lot with him for for that to to play out the way that it does. Yeah. And it's really sad. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now I'd like to talk about talking about this game. <laughs> no. <laughs> How do you guys oh, do that? God. It, it seems terrible. I mean, I try. <laughs> <laughs> it's really Like, you bad. guys volunteered to do it again after oh everything that, you, like, let's, let's catch people up on what it's like to talk about Final Fantasy in public. 
Who wants to go first? Uh, a lot of people want me to die. That's good. Somebody wants me to be impaled. That's cool. No. Uh, <laughs> that was that. Somebody gave like a really descriptive one. I was, just, I mean, like, I, I'm sure I've gotten it the least bad of, of anyone here. Um, but like, I, I definitely hit a point where, you know, after my like, 10th email of like kill yourself i almost just emailed back like come do it yourself you coward (laughs) Uh, (laughs) i really wanted to i respect that i was on the verge of giving someone my home address and being like you come here and shoot me motherfucker (laughs) Um, make me a martyr to final fantasy (laughs) yeah let's do it um yeah i don't know i i think this game is so weird because i think it is at the perfect cross section of like everything wrong in like a lot of gaming discourse right now where one it's this huge franchise that people are obsessed with uh you know it's it's creators that people are obsessed with and are really defensive over it also has this console wars thing behind it because it's a playstation exclusive so then you get the like playstation fanboys who maybe don't care about final fantasy but want to stick it to xbox and then you also get the other side of it which is you know the the weird contingent of like oh, people are complaining because the game's not woke and like bandwagoning on because of that. So you have these like three things butting up and I think it has just made the most combustible video game humanly possible, like engineered in a lab to hurt anyone who talks about it. I mean, the second you try to talk about race in a group of uh, nerd inclined people, you will get guns pointed at your head, essentially. And this is a game that in order to have a narrative about slavery, decided to not have anyone browner than a paper bag in it, you know? Right. It's kind of impossible for me and for Ash to not talk about race. I'm yeah. sitting there playing the game blackly while they're all talking about how they didn't realize separating children from their mothers and turning them into slaves was bad, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I'm supposed to react to that. There's only one way I can react based on who I am in the world. It was wild to me. Going back and forth between that game and this book that I've read that's incredible, Chain Gang All-Stars, I highly recommend it. It takes inspiration, wildly enough, from video games and from anime, but it is about uh, 20 minutes in the future, for-profit prison systems have used their inmates to start a new kind of death sport where uh, certain inmates sign up for a commuted sentence uh, of going on chain gang marches across the United States where they meet up in these battlegrounds and fight each other to death. And it's a much more extreme look at the issue of slavery. But it is, I think, way more impactful and way, way more thoughtful. I can only imagine trying to discuss slavery in the terms that that book does with the kinds of people that play Final Fantasy fourteen, It feels like when you talk to video game fans, they want their products to be treated like art, but they only ever want the review views to serve as affirmations. personal justification, the yeah. affirmations for what they buy. And I'm sorry, you can enjoy Final Fantasy, and I largely enjoyed this game, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a right to say, I think it's weak in these specific areas and strong in others. Yeah, there was there was a weird like I was kind of following some pre-launch threads like on some message boards just to to see how bad I, I should prepare for, for the for the backlash when I knew what you know how we were reviewing it. And it was weird, like there was just this whole contingent of people who were like, this game needs to get a 90 on Metacritic. It means it would mean so much to us for this game to get a 90 on Metacritic because like a Final Fantasy hasn't done it for a while. And I'm like, this game isn't your dad. Like, what are you talking about? Why do you care (laughs) if this game gets a 90 on Metacritic? And yeah, it just feels like people have have tied their personality to a brand here in a way that, again, I, I think it's not just a gaming thing. It happens you know, in, in lots of stuff. It's the same thing as like Marvel versus DC or, mm-hmm. or WWE versus AEW or like mm-hmm. anything where people are just like ascribing, uh, ascribing a sense of self-worth to this game and, and to like these series that, that they love. And I don't know. It's just like, we still can criticize things we love. There, there are plenty of games that I love that I have so many problems with Stranger Paradise. Great example. I really like that game. It's, it's a really, it's a really wild and weird game. Also, it's very something silly, that, like, though. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really silly and has a lot of problems, and it's kind of sloppy in, in a lot of areas. And like, I have no problem talking about that. But I was seeing people who were even reviewing this game really well and giving it like eight point fives or nines or whatever in their scores, and people were still like mad at them 
for even saying anything. And it's just like, do you actually care about the thing or do you just care about the name at that point? Like if, if you're not willing to actually criticize the thing and want it to be better and want to be constructive and, and push these creators to, you know, make a, a better thing. Like, do you actually care about it anymore? And and I just, it makes me wonder if people actually care about Final Fantasy or if they just care about like sticking it to somebody in this way that doesn't really mean anything. It's sports teams. Yes. yes. So yeah. rooting for the logo. <laughs> There's also a weird contingent of people who believe that because this game was developed by Japanese people, that yes. because of that, they're not capable of of perpetuating racist stereotypes, which is really funny considering we're talking about Japan. Don't yeah. wiki that. Um, <laughs> listen, there is a Black Lives Matter movement in Tokyo and it exists there for a reason. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Jaffe and I personally know someone that was subject to the, uh, I think, of racial animosity in Japan and can now no longer live there. Absolutely. So it is very frustrating, I'll say, to see that argument come up again and again. I know, yeah. Ash, you experienced it when you wrote about more specifically about the ways a lack of diversity among the characters of the game really limits the scope and scale of its narrative, especially the kind of narrative it's trying to that say about slavery, yeah. about slavery yeah. you know, and I completely agree with you. I think it's a great article. How much is this a wider problem with all video games and in fact all fantasy so but final fantasy 16 does that weird thing that fine fantasy games can't stop doing where they try to map real world injustices on fake things and mm. it doesn't work because in this specific instance it's people who have magical powers they're bearers they are slaves they are branded on the face so you can differentiate you know people who can use magic versus normal people who can't and it all very much ties to like Jim Crow or um, Jewish uh, persecution and stuff like that. But and they do the same thing in Dragon Age, and they it sure doesn't do. <laughs> it doesn't work because if I am a person who is being discriminated against because I have magic, I'm just going to light you on fire. Listen. <laughs> I was like, where are the slave revolts? There would be yeah. slave revolts, wouldn't they? But then you meet the enslaved people and they're like, don't help us. We want to be enslaved. And it's weird. Yeah. yeah. I have the same problem with X-Men, but that might be a different discussion. <laughs> These allegories don't work because there yeah. is nothing inherently dangerous about me as a black person or somebody else as a Jewish person. Mm -hmm. But there is something, whether you like it or not, inherently dangerous by someone who can light you on fire with your mind. That doesn't mean they should be treated with getting you know the equivalent of a star of david stamped on their face but at the same time you know we should maybe you know the governments and, and people at large should probably come up with some kind of way to ensure that everybody can live safe and free that you know it, it requires yeah. more thought yeah. or whatever it's like, uh, if uh, some people were born with guns for hands yeah <laughs> you, you know, know? <laughs> those people should be able to live free but uh we should also teach them about how you don't want to use your gun hands on everybody you see uh, exactly. what would the slur be for gun-handed people <laughs> <laughs> trigger fingers baby oh <laughs> the, god not in one my yeah. god That's it reminded good. me this game reminded me a lot of uh, Lee Bardugo's uh, The Grishaverse books, which are also on uh, Netflix as Shadow and Bone. So in that narrative, there are people who have native magical ability and they are removed from their families at a young age, but they're taken to a palatial estate and become wards of the state. And they actually have their own political leader and their own mythologies and their own cultural traditions. You know, they are welcomed not into a system of slavery, but into a new separate kind of family that is separate and lesser than but also knows their own power and that at least to really interesting dynamics between magical people and non-magical people and a more understandable level of discrimination and one that feels reasonable but that's also like the thing with the the slavery here it's like they went out of their way to invent like a new version of chattel slavery essentially like it, it's remarkably similar to chattel slavery when there's so many different other kinds of ways people have been enslaved or servants of the state that they could have drawn inspiration from. I just don't know why it had to be this in, in this way and why we never get any perspectives of people who are enslaved. And then they do nothing with them. Yeah. And nothing. It just drops. I went back and I after I beat it, I like went and I reread the Yoshi P interview that like kind of kickstarted the whole the whole red flags for this thing where, you know, the, the 
gives the quote about like, oh, it's like a grounded, it's like based in Europe, you know, and like it's an isolated nation. And one of the things that stood out after playing the game is there was like a line in there where he said something like, you know, when you're dealing with certain plot points, like, you know, you get into a weird thing where no matter what side of the plot point those people are on, it's going to be, it's going to be received in a way. And I, reading it back now, I think what his implication might have been was like, there's slavery in the game and we don't want to have, we don't want to do the cliche of black people being slaves, but also we don't want to have them be the slavers. And it's like, man, if you can't figure out a nuanced way to, to do this, then don't write about it. Like, just right. don't yeah. have a story about this if you can't figure out how to do it. Like, you're not. And it's like, <laughs> you're, yeah. the broader word world of entertainment has lapped them on this issue. It's kind of embarrassing. After reading Chang Gang All Stars, which goes to great lengths to include the perspective of the fictional people who are enslaved and also real examples from American history of how we, the prison system is used for slave labor. It feels embarrassing to watch a, a series of writers just try to s go so wide around the issue without addressing the inherent political problems of it. You know, you could have just gone straight in. Chan Kang All-Stars rules. It is so thrilling and entertaining, and it also makes you really feel a deep empathy for the enslaved in a way that this game doesn't. Like, yes, the game says slavery is wrong, and I'm sure that is like a, a basic bare minimum, and I'm sure a few people playing the game will have never considered that viewpoint before, <laughs> which is <laughs> tragic. But it doesn't make you feel like the enslaved are real people. It because doesn't they're make, not. They're not. They're right. props that for the most part end up lynched and like I don't know how they thought it wasn't going to trigger intense emotional reactions from black players to see slaves get lynched from trees no matter if they're white or not right. yeah man it's just yeah. charged imagery I I was left at the end of the game really wondering why the slavery aspect was there at all it just doesn't seem to matter and they aren't interested in the topic and they I mean they, they go to great lengths Clive eventually becomes a like an enslaved soldier but he never identifies identifies with the enslaved he gets his tattoo removed so he is never no longer visually identified as an enslaved and he doesn't make strong enough connections to fellow bearers to feel like he is one and a part of them he's only ever reinforcing like that he has special blood and he's the only specialist boy that can defeat ultima which is just another way of justifying the divine right of kings which is kind of weird if i can attempt to explain it i really really think they didn't think about it. There are slaves in this game because there are slaves in Game of Thrones. So depressing. Where are the slaves? In the Iron Islands? The Unsullied. Oh, the Unsullied. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my man Grey Worm. Did not know that he was also Lestat in Interview with the Vampire, yeah, and my mind exploded. Ooh. He's Louis de Pontelac, and he's Louis, perfect. Louis, sorry. He's perfect Louis. It's perfect. If you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. That it's so good. Anyway, I could talk about that forever. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels like they took a book of like fantasy tropes and they just started pulling right. them out. And they were like, this one, this one's in the game. Oh, slavery? Oh, yeah, that's in the yes. game too. Slavery like, is in this game as if there was never slavery in the real world. Right. Yeah, it's just that's a what it feels thing. like. <laughs> yeah. When the characters, when literally that scene where Clive is like, well, they just, you know, tested everybody at birth and the children were taken to, to become bearers and I just thought it was for the best. It's like you literally never thought about that. <laughs> None of you right. ever thought about removing a child from their mother and like the trauma that, that, that occurs when you do that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and honestly, I kind of almost wish that, you know, when, when we're talking about like, why doesn't this game seem like it has diversity of peoples in it? Game developers were more willing to just be straight up. And it definitely feels like now that we have seen the game, like they were like, yeah, we probably don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. Not that they would have to have made bearers black. I mean, you could just, you could still include black people in this world. Yeah. That, you know, that in which slavery also exists, you know, just, you know, make sure not everybody's all black or one color on one side or the other. You could have done that. Yeah. And if they had just said, we have these themes in this game that touch on themes that are present in the real world that we thought might have made people uncomfortable if we had included black people or more diverse people in the game. Tell me straight up why. Don't make excuses about, you know, historical accuracy, which is a fallacy in and of itself. You know, don't tell me to like wait and see. Just tell me. 
and I would yeah. respect you a lot more and I would be very much more prepared. And I would re respect you for the fact that you were honest with me up front and I didn't have to discern after the fact like, oh, you guys are doing some fuck shit with this story. and You didn't want to mm -hmm. touch the fact that there be good black people are in this with like a 10 foot pole. I yeah. respected that. And at the same time, the diversity that they do include, which we can quibble about because like there's one area in the game that is supposed to be like this Arabic stand-in and the reason why you know it's an Arabic stand-in because there's sand everywhere and a sitar plays the minute uh, you get there yeah, oh yeah, so yes. it's like even the diversity that they do include is this very one note hackneyed like we're gonna use all the shorthands that we can and then everybody speaks in like a fucking cockney accent yeah <laughs> and nobody's darker than a paper bag I was so gonna like, say in my review and then Gio you'll understand this I grew up in a very Italian uh, hometown I was uh, like yes, there yes, are yes. people who are brown skinned and you know they could be a Sicilians <laughs> they could be <laughs> yeah, Sicilians yeah, and I they could be Middle Eastern or they could be Sicilians it's really no way to tell <laughs> like <laughs> Like the, the the diversity that the game does try to persuade or portray is like extremely one note flat, you know, a child's idea of what diversity is like, sure, fine. I don't even know if you can make the claim if this game just features nothing but white people, because that would do a disservice to like Middle Eastern people that are very clearly trying to be included in this game. But at the same time, like those people too feature like a spectrum of like colors and cultures and mm -hmm. things that get flattened out into sand place with the sitars so it's like yeah man dude what are you doing yeah, it's it's sure. a mishmash of both arabic and indian architecture in there uh arabic and indian clothing styles it is it takes a lot of the things that George R. R. Martin was commenting on. Like he has this whole world that is, you know, representative of things that, you know, like like Dune does, like where it's like, this is Arabia, you know, which is a an orientalized version of real world cultures. But in George R. R. Martin's work, he takes those ideas and then problematizes them. He brings out the contradictions of them and he also tries to tie them closer to real world history so you understand more specifically what it's based on rather than being like a, a, a European person's idea of what mm. quote unquote Arabia would be. Here it's just sort of like they saw the 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 show and was like and then we have an Arabic area. Yeah. Uh, you know? I do want to say this isn't new to Final Fantasy 16. Almost yeah. every Final Fantasy has done something like this to an extent, like, oh, this is this ethnic city. This is that ethnic city. But it's been kind of flattened out as a cartoon. Yeah. And uh, the fact that Final Fantasy 16 looks so like like a big budget project is really what draws out those uh, flat stereotypes and mm -hmm. puts it out on That's display. But this is something that has always been there. That's very true. Is there anything else we'd like to say about people perceiving our uh, our writing about this game online Ugh. and in public spaces? God, just look, if you love video games and you want them to be good, please just be open to people, even giving the mildest critique about right. the games. Like, I like it it does nobody any favors when you just pretend that you love everything in a game and you, you know, will will back it no matter what. Like, you know, criticisms get back to developers a lot of times. Like reviews right. write, I I've been told by PR people like, yeah, we we collect those and we we bring them back. It is it is a really direct way that you can kind of get feedback back to developers and, you know, try Criticism to Criticism is how it, games get better. Yeah, yeah. it's it's how games it's how games get better and like people see critics as such an adversarial thing where it's like oh they're just trying to de like de destroy these developers whatever and it's so silly it's like we, i don't know I, I i can only speak for myself i do this i do criticism because i love it because i love games and i really believe that they can be better and and do better and anytime i'm writing a criticism it's coming from a place of love like i want to see final fantasy 17 really push on the stuff that's amazing here i want to see like the next one be the best version of of the action that's in this and and you know like the the places where they're really strong but there's definitely stuff that's not great in it and even the really glowing reviews even like some of the 10 out of 10 reviews are like it's not perfect and here are problems with it um and and the less we call that stuff out the more you get into the kind of like every game is the same 
you know, where where it's like, we don't need to get better because everyone has accepted that they will just eat this level of game up. And and it's just, if you actually like games, yeah, it's okay to criticize them. It's not a personal attack on you. <laughs> right. Or like, literally, if you don't want to hear about the criticisms, you can just scroll. We're not hurting you. It's not like we yeah. came to a like their house yeah, the thing is, with a gun or anything. They want to hear about the criticism. They want the points. They see critics as the points givers. Yeah. It's, I mean, it is not the reason why I write about video games, right? right? To give all. brands points and or take points away from brands. I want to do what everyone always says that they want from culture, which is to treat games like other forms of art. I come from a cinema background and I, one of my favorite critics ever is Pauline Kael. And I mm -hmm. try to approach everything in the way that she does which is with curiosity and empathy, but also a strong critical eye to acknowledge when pulp does things that are really exciting and fun and new, and when larger, more established brands do things that are rote or mechanical. And I, I do that because I really like them more. Like, Geo, I, I love games. I wish I liked games less. <laughs> they hurt yeah, me. That yeah, would make oh this God, so yeah. much easier. That's something I keep hearing on this show from people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm happy, though, to like exist in a world where I just come out of my cave every four to six months with a review and then return into it and people can scream outside of my cave and I'll never hear about it. <laughs> but I, what I can't really abide is like when it becomes a campaign where it becomes like a weird like smear campaign or harassment campaign to say this person hates games and it is stupid and I'm going to go to their website and send them an email to tell them to kill themselves. You know, I I don't understand that point of view and it makes me feel like these people don't actually like art and don't mean it when they say they want games to be art. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a lot about the gotcha because one of the funniest things that happened to me during this is like, you know, I'm criticizing Final Fantasy 16 for its the way that it treats diversity and you know people flatten that out to like oh you just want more black people or whatever like where were you for first spoken and i'm like oh really you wanted to know where i was for first spoken because i was banging that drum more you than were. anybody else in this you space were. because i fucking love that game so like yes uh, consistency is there and if you cared at all about anything that i do as a writer or cared anything at all about what critics do in this space and we're actually like following what critics are saying about all these different games you would have known that and not stepped on that obvious landmine so it really signals to me like these people don't care about anything that i have to say are not listening to anything that i have to say critically they just want like they just want the points they want the gotcha they want the oh i just exposed you for being a hypocrite when it's like no i've been saying the same thing about all of these games for a very long time it is like a thing that is that is my thing that's what i do so it's really funny that you would think that like oh i'm, I'm only doing this to tear down a game and especially when you bring up another game that i had been nothing but glowing about yeah. because yeah. i love that game we're so the number much. one cheerleader for for spoken and i'm gonna find that code and i'm gonna redeem it now because i liked what square was doing here and I want to see it in a context that's like a little bit less tedious, you know? They're not that dissimilar of games, to be totally honest. There, there's They're a not. lot of similarities. I'm yeah. very excited. I'm really excited to pick. I'm I'm happy to have an RPG to play. I always am, you know? I fucking love Final Fantasy so much. I like 16 enough that I started it on New Game Plus with the Final Fantasy difficulty, which is very fun and very challenging. And I'm probably going to go and skip all the cutscenes just to get to the boss fights. Yeah. And yeah. play it again, The you know? right way to do it after hour eight. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just like, at, for as regressive as the culture of movies, music, and literature are, the culture of video games are so much more regressive. And I feel like the response that people have to us criticizing games fairly, and all of us liked this game, so I don't yes. know why we're <laughs> right. trying to pretend we didn't like it. But yeah. the reaction that people had to us giving measured criticism, the only place I see that in the world of movies anymore is in uh, MCU and DCEU mm. like, yes. uh, like stuff, you know? And the rest of the culture of film has acknowledged and respects the role that critics have within it, the system. But in video games, things are still so corporate as encouraged by development studios, PR departments, that it does become impossible to have any kind of critical conversation about games, even in realms that are not quite as politically charged. And it, 
it is worse for games overall. And more than that, it's really, really bad for developers, like the individual workers that are making the games you like. Mm -hmm. Like if their people aren't turning on us for criticizing games, they are turning on the developers directly for not doing exactly what they want. And that attitude that the consumer gets to dictate content, that comes from PR departments and marketing departments that say power to the player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you mentioned you mentioned like the this co discourse coming up like in the film world and marvel more so than anything or like big blockbusters and i think it does underscore that like a lot of these really big games that we talk about like final fantasy 16 they are kind of our industry's equivalent to those blockbusters more than i think we treat them again it's like these are the game awards games like that's our oscars right these are the best yeah. games when in fact I, th I think a lot of these games are kind of like the MTV People's Choice Award you know, yeah. nominees that you <laughs> yeah. would get, you know, and, and that's fine. Like, I, I love these blockbusters, but I think maybe that's part of it where a lot of the games that you really would get meaningful discussion about and conversation about, like um, uh, what Dordogne came out recently on, on Game Pass. It's like a really beautiful, you know, little four hour uh, narrative game. I, I just feel like maybe there's not room for nuance because these games are ultimately operating at that same blockbuster level that you know, folks who are maybe mostly consuming that, that kind of movie or, or I don't know. That's the thing that I would posit <laughs> is that like these are, yeah. these games are more blockbusters than maybe we, we treat them as sometimes. No, I think you're onto something there. I, I do think these games, AAA games especially, rely on spectacle mm. to please their players. And I think that that has had diminishing returns in terms of the entire industry and the way these games push the entire industry forward. We, I, I do understand the economic tentpole that these games hold, but I also feel like they they take up so much oxygen that you don't get to talk about small experimental things that do actually inspire other developers. Yeah. Well, absolutely. we do appreciate the kinds of things that you have to say about video games here. And uh, I'd like you to briefly plug where people can find your writing elsewhere online for those of our listeners who mostly know you through podcasting. Well, my Twitter account is currently locked and it may never come unlocked, but I'm Excellent. XOXO Gossip Gita everywhere. And I have a sub stack where I will round up whatever I'm writing uh, once a month and write a little essay just as a bonus. Um, and uh, if you find me on those social media accounts, just be nice to me. Thank you. Bye. Uh, our <laughs> listeners will. We're, we're good people here. <laughs> I'm Ash. Um, you can find me uh, pretty much everywhere at ad Ashtra, A-D-A-S-H-T-R-A. I currently write about video games for The Verge, so you can catch all of my stuff there. And I will occasionally write about things on my Twitter account that is not locked, uh, but probably should be. <laughs> the Verge, great uh content bad logo <laughs> uh and i'm i'm giovanni i'm uh at mario prime on twitter and you can find my writing about video games currently on digitaltrends.com all right before we close i had a list of like 20 questions here from our listeners that we did a really good job of addressing throughout the content of this conversation but there is one more left uh, so I'm going to turn this over to our lightning returns round <laughs> as uh, submitted by a community member, Connor. Uh, we need to rank the top 10 hottest Final Fantasy boys right now. Ooh. Oh, my God. Easy. We can do that. That's all. <laughs> no, that's not hard at all. all Your right. confidence. I'm so impressed by you. I mean, si Clive is now on the list, right? Clive, yes. it does make Ooh. the list. Okay, we'll start with Clive. No, okay, so... Define your terms. Do you mean main characters or do you mean overall? Because if you mean overall, we're going to be here forever. If you mean main characters, we can do this in two minutes. Okay, let's let's stick to main characters because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, unranked top 10. We'll definitely include Clive now. Sure. Yeah, I'm down with that. Um, Definitely includes Cloud because he's just the OG. You Cloud know. hotter or less hot than Clive? Less hot. Okay, yeah. that, that makes sure, sense. Sure, sure. I'll go with All that. Right. Okay, We're only characters. talking like main main characters, like main playable characters. We're not getting into like a Sephiroth or a, a, a Sid in this game. We're talking yeah. about main dudes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I think Beneath Cloud for me is Noctis. Correct. Mm. Yes, I love that. I love that. Uh, is there anyone hotter than Cloud or hotter than Clive? There must be, right? I'm yeah. going to vouch for the rogue from Final Fantasy 1. He's got the charm <laughs> to him. Okay, I got you. Who's hotter than Clive? Lightning. Oh my god. You did say boys, though. I did say boys. It's a boys. 
Lightning's uh, an Akatic area of her own. How do we feel about Titus from Final Fantasy X? We, love him. we don't feel anything idiot. about him. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I love him good, so good. much, though. Uh, if you're into himbos, then I suppose he could be on the list. Below Noctis. But he's not a hotter himbo than Zidane is. That's true. Titus, okay, so I Zidane, think... then, uh, then Titus. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What about Squall? I was about to say, Squall's got to be up there, right? I honestly think Squall... He's not the hottest one even in his game. It's Irvine. <laughs> That's very fair. But I do <laughs> think Squall could fit in between Cloud and Noctis, though. Yeah. I think he's hotter than Noctis. Sure. But do we think mm-hmm. Zidane is hotter than Squall? Okay, what version of Noctis? Because adult Noctis will definitely be Squall. Oh, damn, but, that's like, true. Squall will be normal Noctis. I was thinking pouty, sad, normal Noctis. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's let's just throw out really quick uh, our, our good boy from Final Fantasy, Stranger of Paradise, Alex. I'll What's allow his name? It. Alex Garland. It, I, I, yeah. Angry man. <laughs> is he Is he in? Is That's he not? That's Jack, right? Jack. Yes, Jack, Jack Garland. Jack, Garland. Jack, thank you. Uh, is he in? Is he not in? How I think feel? he's I, in. He, if he's him. in, he's at the bottom of the list. Yeah, totally. that's true. Below Titus, all right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Who else we got? Jeez. Who else ones. we got? Um, I'm going to throw out my rogue and swap him out for the rogue with a personality lock from Final Fantasy VI. I was going to say, like, who is the main sure. character in Final Fantasy VI? Is it Locke? Is the it main Tara? boy Tara, is Locke. Okay. No, you're right. Yeah, Locke is really cute. You can make an argument for Terra. You can make an argument for Selyse, but the, the main boy is Locke. Lock, okay, and lock on this list, I would put above Zidane, below Noctis, though, for me. That makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I yeah. love that. I'm going to make the argument that Balthier is the main character of Final Fantasy XII, just so we don't have to include Vaughn, because yes. I don't think he belongs on the I list. I will allow Balthier. Thank you. Well, if you're going to allow Balthier, then we're going to have to put him up higher, because he's definitely higher than Noctis and, Dude, yeah, he and is. Squall. Yeah, he's right below Cloud. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. He might be above Cloud because that, I don't like Cloud's personality, but Balthier could get it at any time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Are we all okay with that? I'm okay. Sure. I'll take yeah, it. Why not? Yeah. Absolutely. Hell Are yeah. Are we saying that Clive is the hottest Final Fantasy boy I, to date? It feels wrong, but maybe. His voice really does for me. Yeah. Like It doesn't the... feel wrong at all because exactly like, he just, like his voice is there. He's mm. got the personality and he's got the looks. And he's also like as the, the Kendall Roy uh, obsessy among us, he's got the like <laughs> sad dog look that really does it for me. I like, was going to say that when you were imitating his voice early in the show, you were absolutely doing your Jeremy Strong voice. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I love people that look like they need to be wrapped up in a blanket with a mug of tea and that's exactly what he looks like. Yeah. I think... I I think I'm I'm good with Clive though. I will say I think Torgal probably actually number one <laughs> best, best boy. For well, we need one boy. more boy on this list, and I will argue that Vincent Valentine is the main character of Final Fantasy VII: Dirge of Cerberus. That's correct. You are absolutely correct. Sure. Put him on the yeah. list. He works. Yeah. All right. No, where does right. he go? I had such a big crush on him as an yeah. angsty hot topic shopping teen. I'd put him above Cloud. Well, then by that token, we're gonna have to include Zach. We would have to include Zach. No, uh, I guess we would have to include <laughs> Zach. No, Fuck. but I like Crisis I think. Core. Oh my god, this is this so. This is why stressful. I like not having Brandon, Tim, and Frank on the show. I can say fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I think, okay, it's the top 10, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I think we can put Vincent Valentine on there, yep. and then accept this list as as it is. All right, Vincent above Cloud, below Balthier? Yes. Yeah. Sure. All right, that-, that is our list. We've got it. We got a lot done today, folks. Congratulations. Thank we should you. be proud of ourselves. This is the last we ever have to talk about Final oh, Fantasy XVI. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Uh, if anyone Literally. wants to talk about it, you can just refer them to this podcast. Geo, it was a pleasure. We will definitely have you on in the future for like a regular style episode. Absolutely. Um, be thrilled to. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And this won't be the last you hear of Ash or Gita either. Uh, here is my sign off. If you enjoyed this episode of Insert Credit or any episode, please rate and review our show wherever and however you can. You could also support us on patreon.com slash insert credit, where you could become a patron to submit your own questions, listen to monthly bonus episodes, and get more exclusive content. If you'd like to sponsor our show with an advertisement or personal message, it's easy and affordable to do that. Just contact us at show at insertcredit.com. You could also join our community at forums.insertcredit.com or find videos of these episodes on youtube.com slash insertcreditshow. 
please wishlist Demon School on Steam by Brandon Sheffield's own Necrosoft Games. Listen to our sister show, The Video Game History Hour, with Frank Cifaldi and Kelsey Lewin. Uh, this episode is edited by Esper Quinn, with original music by Kurt Feldman. You can find his music at kurtfeldman.bandcamp.com. I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Ash Parrish. <laughs> I'm Keita Jackson. And I'm Giovanni Colantonio. And when you play Final Fantasy 16, you win or you die. That's the show. Congratulations, everybody. We uh, did it. That was a good pod. That was awesome. Good, pod. good ass pod.